This is your brain on a story. Okay, sure, not every story will be instantly addicting to the first time user. But crack open the right book or spark up a particularly potent movie or TV show, and before you know it, you could slip into a state of narrative attentiveness so intoxicating you'll forget your worldly surroundings, the bodily pangs of hunger and thirst, and eventually even the need to go to the bathroom. And the high can last for hours. Bones might go entirely unchecked. The dog won't get to run in the yard. But you won't care, because you'll be in another world. A world full of interesting incidents and colorful characters. Characters whose eyes you'll see this brave new world through. Man, like why am I wearing a dress? Minute by minute, page by page, you'll be pulled deeper into the story forest, led by a carefully laid string of narrative morsels the writer laid out for you to consume in your new single-minded and obsessive need to know, to find out what happens next. Long-term side effects of a truly powerful story include moderate to severe emotional catharsis, heightened empathy for others, and in rare cases, a challenged worldview. So, yeah, it's pretty awesome. It's completely mental. But seriously, don't forget to take a break every now and then and let that pooch out. Now, if you're anything like me, the only problem you have with stories that transport you mind, body, and soul is that there aren't nearly enough of them out there. Why don't all stories have the same spellbinding effect on the audience? Why do some narratives seem to effortlessly drive us from the very first scene to the last without us ever becoming aware we're being taken for a ride? And other stories, well, they can stop and start and sputter with jerky exposition and flashback, drift off into tangential dishes, and sometimes straight up crash and burn before reaching their destination. Oh, shit! Maybe even before ever really getting off the ground. In other words, what gives a story enough horsepower to keep the audience interested and invested from start to finish? And what does this mean for a storyteller when they sit down to write a single scene? In this episode of Cinematic Storytelling, we'll be exploring what forces propel us from scene to scene in a story. We'll be looking at how successful writers manage to keep things moving in their scenes. And I'll be giving you my three-part diagnostic check for making sure your scenes are fully functional and ready to hit the road. So buckle up, buckaroos, because today we're talking narrative drive. So we want to understand what jumpstarts a story, kicks it into next gear, and puts the pedal to the metal with the audience in tow. We want to write stories that get people saying things like, I couldn't put it down, or it's a short two hours, or just one more chapter before bed. But what exactly are we looking for? What drives narrative? We might start by considering a story's pacing, the length and variation of the scenes and even the sentences, not, not quite my temple. the amount of white space on the page that makes reading more fluid, and the rate of change within scenes, or the revelations per minute. We could also look at individual scenes within a story and ask how the audience is positioned in relation to vital story information. Writers use three modes of knowledge impartation and storytelling to manipulate audience curiosity and maximize tension. Mystery, where we know less than some of the characters. What's in the box? What's in the fucking box? Suspense, where knowledge is shared with the audience and characters at the same time. <laughs> and dramatic irony, where the audience knows more information than a character. Sir, no, wait, 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 wait. No, sir, don't, don't. <laughs> Narrative drive may also refer to any number of authorial choices meant to break the audience's built-in resistance to doing work, mainly the adoption of a writing ethic that favors active verbs and short scenes, and seems allergic to exposition, flashback, uses of the passive voice, and sometimes even prose itself. But while all these are true and worthy considerations for the writer composing a scene, they are only technical, structural, and stylistic choices that complement and enhance the telling of a story. They do not address the heart of why we invest our attention and emotions into story. Why, despite our cynical impulse to separate fact from fiction, we find ourselves coming to care deeply about made-up characters stuck in fabricated dilemmas and holding a personal interest in discovering what happens next. Imagine you've been invited up onto the stage of a popular game show where a large wheel of fortune stands before you. Half of the wheel's segments is colored red, the other half blue. Without saying a word, the host motions you forward, 
You walk up and spin the wheel, and you step back, silent and waiting. Are you on the edge of your seat yet? Is your breath baited? Of course not. That's because you have no context for what blue or red means in this wheel spin. But what if before spinning the wheel, this time the host were to tell you if your spin lands on blue, you'll receive a prize of $10,000. However, if the needle hits on a red segment, you'll lose your house and your job and your beloved dog. Wouldn't you have a bit more invested in the outcome of that wheel spin? And what if instead of winning $10,000, the prize was access to a rare life-saving drug that someone in your family desperately needed? What if there was only a single blue segment in the entire wheel, making the odds even greater that you would fail those who rely on you? See, to keep us engaged, to keep us invested throughout a scene, we need to know what the characters are playing for and what they stand to lose if they don't get it. Otherwise, we're left adrift at sea without any sense of north or south, of whether characters are getting closer to or further from their goals. And when this happens, we tend to pull back, to disengage, change the channel, or set the book down and to say things like, eh, I just wasn't feeling this story, or it was slow, didn't really feel like it was going anywhere. It's not often we stop to ask why a story is interesting to us. Rather, we experience story, and the experience is made all the more painless and fluid when the rules are well defined. The key to getting emotional buy-in, then, is making crystal clear for the audience what it is the character desires and why going after that specific goal might not turn out so well. David Corbett says in his book, The Art of Character, there is often no more crucial question to ask in the course of a scene than what within it renders your characters vulnerable, since it so often ties into what he wants. What are the stakes? What's at risk? What is the harm that might be done? Once we identify a character's desired goal state and understand the dynamic forces of opposition arranged against them, the scene becomes imbued with meaning and significance, and our emotional and intellectual curiosity automatically begins projecting expectation into the future, asking questions and trying to solve the problem with our own brains, thereby involving ourselves personally with the story, which means writing a scene that drives the audience to want to know more consists of finding various ways to articulate the desires, stakes, and questions readers and viewers intuitively seek out in order to make sense of what's going on. This is especially true of the very shortest scenes, which have been stripped of all fat, leaving behind only efficient story-forward moments. Characters enter the scene and quickly establish their respective desires. Lord Stark, your presence has been requested in the small council chamber. A meeting has been called. I need to see the king first. Alone. The risks associated with those desires are raised. The king is at the small council meeting, my lord. He has summoned you. Is it about my wife? And a singular question is posed to the audience, which drives our own desire to want to know more. No, my lord. I believe it concerns Daenerys Targaryen. In this case, the question posed by the scene makes us wonder, what's up with Daenerys Targaryen? The whore is pregnant. Oh, uh, congratulations. No. And this pattern of story-forward-looking moments can be found in the majority of scenes in any given story, regardless of the genre, whether stated directly or hidden just below the surface of the text. Desires? Well, right now we're looking at others, and we need help with that. I work murders. I don't know what you think I could help you with. Stakes? Now, this could go two ways, Sean. Either you know what happened, and how those drugs got into a car that was already searched by officers, in which case you're a witness. Or you become a suspect. A question. Am I going to lose my job over this? And if we want to write scenes that move, we need to train our ear like a musician to hear these moments when they happen in scenes that move us. So first, let's take a closer look at how these moments are commonly expressed within scenes. Before we can take the audience on a thrilling ride, we first need to know our destination. In story, this is known as the object of desire, or the overarching goal for the character that sets them on their journey of trying to solve a problem. Objects of desire can be big or small, important or trivial. Uh, well, sir, it's uh, this rug I have. They really tied the room together. Not every protagonist is going to want to save the world from impending doom or solve a decades-old murder mystery. But as Kurt Vonnegut once remarked, every character should want something, even if it is only a glass of water. Animated musicals of the Disney Renaissance era popularly featured an entire number that would express the protagonist's singular object of desire in what became known as the I Want Song. Oh, ooh, be -doo. Ooh, be -doo. I want to be like you. You want adventure in the great white somewhere. And 
while these catchy tunes we remember so well do a fantastic job at spelling out in detail the broad but low resolution goal state of the story's character, the writers of these beloved films still had to articulate I want moments at the more narrow but higher resolution level of every single scene. And what's more, each of these smaller scene desires the character expresses has to logically tie back to that overarching story desire, the same way that if we set out on a road trip from New York to Los Angeles, Getting through Ohio might be our goal in the current moment, but every state passed on our journey is in service of the ultimate goal of hitting the Pacific Coast. But how do we communicate these scene goals to the audience if we're not going to sing it to them? I've been dreaming! Well, the simplest way is to just come right out and say it. I want blank. It's not that simple. Yeah, actually, it is. It says here, when you graduate, you want to come to work for me in behavioral science. You wish to be a crime reporter in Japan. I want to teach calculus next year. <laughs> Boy, you, uh, you want to cook crystal meth? Because I want to be great. I want to earn enough money I can get away from everyone. I want to be one of the greats. I want no one else to succeed. I want my money back. I think I want my money back. I don't want more money. Well, what do you want then? You know what I want. What do you want from me? What do I want from you? I want you. What? I want my girlfriend back. I want you flat on your back. I want a divorce. What is it that you want? I just want to eat. I don't want lunch. I want breakfast. <laughs> I want a milkshake. I want potato You'll chip. get nothing and like it. What do you want? You, you want the moon? What do you want? I just want my phone call. What do you want, Kate? What would you like done? I want to follow some semblance of procedure. I want him dead. Mother and child, both. I want him dead. I want his family dead. I want to die. Why won't they let me die? I want to live again. I want to live again. That was all I wanted. Now, you may consider yourself a literary artist who doesn't produce pulp entertainment for the slobbering masses. But know you are not above coming out directly and saying in plain English what it is a character wants. Even the masters do it. All I want is a truce. Which means, it's okay. It doesn't make you a hack. I want moments become as invisible to the audience as the dialogue tags he said and she said in a book. You can choose to dress it up if you wish, sort of like hiding vegetables under a layer of melted cheese. And there are many forms the I want moment can take to disguise itself. I need your clothes, your boots, and your motorcycle. <laughs> Why are you here? Don't go. I have to. I think this place could be so different from all the other places we've been at. You got liquor, we got money. You see what I'm driving? Feel free to wrap your I want in whatever packaging suits your style. Hell, you can even bury the cable so far under the text it never appears in the dialogue at all and is only visually communicated. What do you want? But do not be afraid to write scenes where characters literally describe out loud and in full what it is they're after. This isn't holding the audience's hand. Clarity will not subtract from your artistic integrity, but it will make the scene more accessible, readable, and therefore effective at making the audience want to find out what happens next. So we have a destination. We know what we're playing for. But as in life, there's no reward without risk. No immortal garland to be run for without dust and heat. What hidden dangers might emerge should the character achieve their goal? What happens if they don't? In other words, what's at stake? And are the stakes high enough to make the audience care whether or not this desire is achieved? Storytellers are constantly contending with stakes. These pesky things are always needing to be raised. The bar is always needing set higher and higher. We just need to up the stakes substantially. Heart-pounding, white-knuckled, life-or-death stakes are easiest for the audience to read and understand, since they speak to those primal urges within us to avoid threats to our safety and continue existence. But demonstrating ever-present risk in smaller, quieter scenes with explosive spectacle can often feel tonally inconsistent, arbitrary, or flat-out lazy. After all, we can't simply inject surprise ninja attacks into every scene, right? So how is the audience supposed to understand what's at stake if the danger isn't dropping on their heads? Well, as with the character's scene desire, you have to show them or tell them with what I call the if-then statement, a moment of risk assessment and deliberation by one or more of the characters in the scene that says if a certain course of action is taken to achieve the stated goal, these possible consequences are likely to be the result. Like the I want moment, 
This is most often stated clear as day, simply, without pageantry or pomp. The if-then statement answers the question, so what, why should we care, that arises from the character's stated goal. It may also speak to what motivates the character to want this particular desire in the first place. I need to look strong. If we lose Nevada, O'Brien is going to kill us in the house over this China thing. And since characters are the avatar stand-in for the audience to project onto, chances are, if the stakes matter to the character, they'll matter to you. Does it matter, Terry? It does matter! This is the fucking Queen's China! Shh. Laying down the ground rules with an if-then statement automatically generates expectation. I swear to God, I'll pistol whip the next guy that says shenanigans. Hey, Farva, what's the name of that restaurant you like with all the goofy shit on the walls and the mozzarella sticks? You mean shenanigans? Articulating the stakes within a scene limits the possibilities of what may happen, which sounds counterintuitive to telling an exciting story full of twists and turns. But this narrowing of potentiality actually pulls us closer to the story since we now hope for or dread specific outcomes down the road in future scenes. If you're still fucking with those donuts right now, I'm gonna fuck your day up, you hear me? If you choose to face Vader, you will do it alone. Put on the badge, and if you ever take it off again, I swear to the mother, I'll pin the damn thing on Jamie Lannister. <laughs> if you If you tell Logan, he might kill you. If you're killed in the Matrix, you die here. And what if... He gets killed. If Ishida dies, it was our will and love him. Because if the army finds out you're a girl, the penalty is death! And also like the I want moment, there are several forms the if-then statement can take, ranging from the overt and unblushing to the subtextual. Ride with me against my enemies and you shall have all my son promised you and more. Until we hold the steel he pledged us, the little lion's life is ours. When it comes to staying out of prison, anything's up for grabs. As long as you live under my ocean, you'll obey my rules. But if you would just listen... No, y'all will get me 100 Nazi scalps, taken from the heads of 100 dead Nazis. Or you will die trying. And once we have the desire and risk articulated within the scene, there's only one question left. What's going to happen next? This is the question every scene should make the audience ask themselves. If the writer has done their job, the audience knows full well what the characters are after, and they understand what's at stake if the scene goes one way or another, because the story took the time to share it with them. Now to stimulate their imagination and make them eager to know what's around the next corner, something has to happen that forces the audience to draw upon the shared knowledge and then leaves them hanging off the side of a cliff waiting for more. I once brought a jackass and a honeycomb into a brothel. Stop. Next. I do want to hear the end of that, though. Let's invent a character inside a scene. We'll call her Mary. Mary is employed at a well-known lifestyle magazine and has dreams of one day becoming a permanent staff writer, but she currently only works part-time as a copy editor because the flexible hours allow her time off to spend at the hospital with her terminally ill mother, something her last two jobs did not. Her boss, Mr. Turner, is an amiable enough fellow with a simple fashion quirk. Every time he fires an employee, he wears a blue tie to the office. On Friday morning, Mary stops by the hospital as she normally does, but afterwards she hits a traffic jam that causes her to be a half hour late to work. As soon as she sits down at her desk, she hears her name called. It's her boss, standing in the doorway to his office. He says he'd like a word with Mary. He's wearing his blue tie. Whatever happens next, our intellectual gears have already been set in motion. We'll ask questions and run mental simulations of what we think might happen based on information we currently know. What is Mr. Turner going to say? Why is he wearing the blue tie? Is Mary going to lose her job? Anticipatory questions like these charge future scenes with expectation and intrigue, driving us to want to learn more to satisfy our inquiring minds, only to find the next scene as open-ended and thought-provoking as the previous one. Good scenes give answers to earlier questions, but great scenes, scenes that keep us hooked to the story, set up another dramatic question to be answered in another scene. Like a shark, the narrative needs to keep moving or else it dies. If Mr. Turner calls Mary into his office and explains he's had to let go one of their top writers following a public scandal and he wants Mary to replace the position right away, a significant promotion that will see Mary featured in next month's issue but would require her to immediately move up to full-time hours. We will have satisfactory answers to the questions raised by the previous scene, but new questions will crop up to take their place. 
Is Mary willing to give up her final days by her mother's side to take the position? Will she deny Mr. Turner's offer to have her dream job? What will Mary choose? And this pattern will continue, scene by scene, in a string of cause and effect that builds on what came before and casts intrigue into the future. Episodes of conflict may resolve within scenes, but there shouldn't be a feeling of finality to any of them until the very end of the story. I'm finished! As with the I want moment and the if then statement, dramatic questions come in various forms and can be implied through a scene's context or stated outright in the dialogue. They can be as simple as a look between two characters who will eventually come into conflict, an offhand remark, We're finally leaving this shithole, or the discovery of a new clue that leads the hero in a new direction, so long as they drive the audience to want to know more. The next move is yours, Charles. What's it to be? But of course, to find out, they'll have to keep reading, they'll have to keep watching. So let's now take four scenes from different genres made for different audiences and see how they give expression to these moments of narrative drive. For these examples, we'll be using the 2017 survival drama Jungle, HBO's Prohibition-era gangster saga Boardwalk Empire, the 2006 quirky tragic comedy Little Miss Sunshine, and the 2014 psychological thriller Nightcrawler. First up, the I Want Moments. When a raging river separates Yossi Ginsberg from his raft and friend, the young Israeli traveler finds himself stranded in the Amazon rainforest, miles from help and with very few tools to survive long enough for any rescue team to find him. After the sun goes down, his sleep is disturbed by a strange noise. He reaches into his bag for something, anything to help, and comes out with a can of DDT and a lighter. The scene doesn't have to do much to convince us of Yossi's desire as the rainforest setting provides ample dangers and visual threats any rational human would want to avoid. The sound of a nocturnal predator nearby and Yossi's physical action to protect himself allow the I want moment of the scene to be left off the page. Yossi wants to live, because otherwise we don't have a story. But the complex network of gang relationships and territory disputes of New York in 1931 is probably not as readily accessible to an audience and requires a bit more clarity in the text. In this scene, Charlie Luciano and Benjamin Siegel approach Dr. Valentin Narcisse, the self-composed heroin trafficker who runs Harlem, and demand he pay fealty to the new mob boss in town, Salvatore Maranzano. You had that deal with Joe the boss. We engaged as necessary. Mr. Maranzano would like it to continue. Luciano wants Narcisse to submit to Maranzano and the Italians. You got the policy game, the dope the clubs and you got all those whores what I have belongs to me and Dr. Narcisse wants to remain independent though the I want moments here are dressed up ever so slightly the dialogue makes a clear impression what desires are at play early on in the scene the little miss sunshine scene however hides its I want moment a little deeper in the form of a question that makes the audience fill in the character desire the dysfunctional Hoover family is on a road trip to get Olive to the Little Miss Sunshine beauty pageant in Redondo Beach, California. Wanting to help her husband share the 800-mile burden, Cheryl Hoover attempts to learn to drive the aging Volkswagen van. Only to grind the gears so badly, the family ends up spending half their morning at a local mechanic shop, where they're told a replacement clutch will take days to order. Is there a uh, dealership around here? Richard's question implies he wants to continue the journey to find another vehicle to get Olive to the beauty pageant, no matter the cost, because... There's no sense in entering a contest if you don't think you're gonna win. Are you gonna win? And last, we have Lou Bloom in Nightcrawler, a petty thief who makes a living stealing from construction sites around Los Angeles and pawning off what he can to local scrapyards. Excuse me, sir. I'm looking for a job. In fact, I've made up my mind to find a career that I can learn and grow into. Simple and direct. This thief wants a career change, something with meaning. Lou wants to bloom into something greater. So we have our wants, life, independence, a car, a job. Pretty standard desires just about any audience could relate to. But how do these scenes articulate the stakes of these four goals? What motivations lie behind this goal? What will it cost the character to pursue this goal? What's standing in their way from achieving this goal? In the scene from Jungle, context once again conveys the if-then statement visually. If Yossi wants to survive the next 60 seconds, he needs to get this makeshift flamethrower working. The physical blocking of the lighter and bug spray between Yossi and the leopard creates an unmistakable barrier that, if breached, spells out certain doom for the character. No need for Yossi to scream out, 
Gee, I sure hope I can get this lighter working, or else I'm leopard lunch. In Harlem, though, dangers are not so surface level. They often come with a smile and a hat in the hand, but the ambient violence of the criminal world colors even small talk pleasantries with a tinge of trouble. People are losing things all over. Some guy, he's a millionaire. Next thing you know, he's selling chiclets in the street. Or worse. Ben Siegel's ominous follow-up line signals the scene's risk. If Narcisse says no to Maranzano, he could have everything taken away from him, including his life. Here, Charlie and Ben deliver the good doctor the if-then statement in the form of an ultimatum, an either-or, this or that. Back at the mechanic shop, Richard is distraught after learning all the car dealerships around are closed for the weekend. But he can't risk giving up on this road trip, or else he'll look like a hypocrite in front of his entire family. Now, will this kill him, the way leopards and gangsters kill people? No. But for Richard to fail now would result in the death of the man he believes he is inside. A winner. Someone who gets it done. And those stakes are no less real to Richard, and therefore the audience, in this scene. And it's here the mechanic offers an unorthodox solution that tests how far Richard is willing to go to get Olive to California. You don't need the clutch to, to change from, uh, from the third to the fourth. As long as you keep parking on a hill and you let it go, and it goes 15, 20 miles per hour, you start it on third and then you go from third to fourth. If the Hoover family wants to continue their journey, they'll need to work with what they have, broken clutch and all. My motto is, if you want to win the lottery, you have to make the money to buy a ticket. If Lou wants to become wealthy and successful, he first needs a steady source of income, which means getting this job isn't just a matter of securing a minimum wage position. It's the first step towards Lou's ultimate dream of a life worth living, of a one-way ticket out of the humdrum existence other people live. And failing so early into his journey, as with Richard's egoic fantasy of himself, for Lou, the stakes here are nearly as high as life and death. And the if-then statement, corny as it is, brings this into focus for the audience. And lastly, all four scenes end with a question that can be synonymized as, what happens next? <laughs> After fighting off the leopard, Yossi looks around for other signs of danger, and we wonder with him, was that enough to scare away the leopard? Will Yossi survive the rest of the night? Which of course drives us to the next scene, but also relates to the larger story question of whether or not Yossi will make it out of the jungle alive at all. In New York, the sit-down has turned into a shakedown, and Dr. Narcisse decides this is one offer he can refuse. I thank you both for your concern. And I'm sorry you came up this far for nothing. But Charlie Luciano leaves him with an observation that suggests their business is far from concluded. What I love about the city, everything's so close. As the gangsters show themselves out, we have to wonder, what will Maranzano do once he learns Narcisse refused him? What reprisals lie in store for Dr. Narcisse now that he's taken a stand? We won't get our answers in the very next scene, as Boardwalk Empire is a long-form, ensemble cast story with multiple storylines and points of view. But questions like these and the anxiety they bring keep us invested and forward-looking as the narrative unfolds. At the auto shop, Richard has just been given an unorthodox solution to his car troubles, but he still has some concerns, and his dialogue explicitly voices the scene's dramatic question. What if you're not on a hill? There's no hill. What if there's no hill? What do you think? How will the van gain momentum from a level starting position? Well, the next scene provides the answer. The Hoovers will have to push themselves up to speed and then hop in like they're jumping onto a moving train. In other words, they'll have to work together as a family, something they're not great at, which of course sets up more questions for the inquisitive audience. How will this new complication affect the rest of their road trip journey? And will this family really be able to successfully work together as a team? Fuck a lot of women, Dwayne. Eight. Not just one woman. Dead. A lot of women. That's enough, right? What are you guys talking about? Politics. Oh. After laying himself bare before the scrapyard foreman, Lou doesn't get the answer he was looking for. I'm not hiring a fucking thief. Now he and the audience must ask, what will Lou do for money now? And once again, it's the next scene that introduces an answer, as Lou stumbles upon a fiery sight that ignites a drive in him to chase down a new career opportunity. And we too are driven to stick around long enough to see how it all turns out. Because being the inquisitive rubberneckers we are, until we get answers to our burning questions, we just can't stop staring. 
And that's Narrative Drive. So if you want to keep your audience invested and glued to their seats no matter where your story is headed, consider these techniques the next time you sit down to work on a scene. Are you stuck staring at a blank page without an idea as to how to begin? Use the three narrative drive moments as a generative jumping off point to get you started. Identify your character's desire lines, delineate the stakes involved with pursuing those desires, and ask what question you want to leave the audience scratching their heads at by the scene's end. Are there ways you can visualize any of these moments in the scene's setting and action, or do they need to be outlined in the dialogue? Does it serve the scene better to have these moments stated directly, or can you find ways to subtextually talk around them without losing clarity? You might not have a finished scene at the end of this process, but you will have clear and attainable checkpoints your scene has to hit along its journey, and that will begin to help you see the scene's shape and structure. But if, on the other hand, you already have a scene that isn't working for whatever reason, and you aren't sure where it lags, use these techniques as a diagnostic tool to help you troubleshoot your writing. Run your scene through the same analysis of narrative drive moments to see if you're engaging the audience's curiosity and involving them in the storytelling process. Chances are you'll find one of these moments not pulling its weight, which can give you some helpful direction as you run maintenance and get the scene back up to speed. Well, we've reached the end of the road in today's video. I hope the ride wasn't too bumpy. I want to thank you for watching and for supporting this channel. If you enjoy this type of content and want to see more, please consider subscribing and sharing with a friend. So I guess the only question now is, what's going to happen in the next episode of Cinematic Storytelling?